What's up, Agent Sanders? Jason Swank got another amazing guest, and we're going to talk with Eric of Hawk Media and how they built an almost $40 million agency, or probably by now they're already over $40 million and cressing the many, many commas, whatever in there. So excited to get in the episode. Let's jump in. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Excited to have you on. So tell us who you are and what do you do? Sure. Uh, Eric Huberman, co uh, founder and CEO of Hawk Media. We're basically an outsourced CMO and marketing team to companies. So we go into brands, identify holes in the marketing org, and then spin up different experts all a la carte month to month. So it could be a Facebook marketer, email marketer, web designer. I've uh, been around about eight years, about 270 full-time people, run marketing for about 600 brands. And then we also have a venture fund and a financing arm as well, amongst many other things. Awesome. And so why did you guys start an agency? What got you into it? Uh, I built and sold a couple e-com brands and through my own experience, as well as then I started advising and consulting for a lot of other brands, found uh, that 99% of agencies out there are, for lack of a better word, full of shit and kept getting frustrated over and over again and went, screw it, I'm just gonna hire my own small team to help these companies. And so built my little SWAT team and immediately saw the benefits. Like, like my clients started to uh, like what we did, they started to grow and we started to need more and more people and just started to grow from there. Awesome. And what were, so you guys have been doing it for eight years. You guys are almost at yep. 40 million or maybe over it. Talk about some of the progression that you guys went through. Like, how long did it take to get over the million mark? Was it fairly quick? Did it take long? Like, what clicked? That kind of stuff. Yeah, in the first week of business, I shouldn't say first week. I think it was like a month in because the first month I wasn't sure what I was like. I built this team. I started working on clients and I was like, maybe I'll build my next company and then turn this team into my own team. And so I wasn't sure what I was going to do there. And then after a month, I was like, wow, this is really working. I should double down on this. And so I set a goal and I would have put it on a thermometer. I was like, all right, the first four years, we're going to do one, two and a half, five, 10 million. That's, that's the goals. And we came within 1% of all four of those goals. So I think there's a lot to be said about setting a goal and then really driving to hit it and having incremental goals to get there. So you know how you're tracking against that goal because it forces you when you're falling behind to step up. And if it's a, it's a too easy of a goal, you actually end up aiming lower, you will hit that goal still. <laughs> like it's, I don't think when you set a goal, you end up blowing past it, you manage accordingly. So uh, setting those goals really helped the first four years. And frankly, we didn't set goals for years five and six. And I saw the downside of that. I saw us not grow as fast, not do as well, not really know which direction we were going. Because it also at that point, we were big enough that it felt weird to just set another financial goal. It's like, what? Well, yeah, but what were we really trying to do? And it took a couple of years to develop that, but so we're pretty clear. And, and you listed out financial goals. Were they? Were there any other goals? Not and not talking about the in, incremental goals. I want to get to those in a second. But were, was it just revenue goals? And then, hey, what are the little ones that we need to do to get there? Yeah, frankly, it was because that was the best scoreboard we had. It wasn't because there wasn't any. It was intrinsic in the sense of like the goal was a goal because it was the goal. It wasn't because then we could afford this or we could do that. It was more of just an indicator of growth. And we assumed that if we're hitting those numbers, we're also growing in the ways we need to be growing. And so. We knew what the levers that we needed to pull were between bringing a new business, retaining our business, retaining our people, all sorts of specific metrics that helped us hit those goals. That became a factor of it. That, uh, But it was that was the end scoreboard. That was sort of the result that we were looking for. So let's talk about the incremental goals at the stage to get to the million in the first year. And then let's talk about the incremental goals after that for the two and a half to five. I think that'd be interesting. Sure. Yeah, we just knew... Basically, and this is a rough number, we actually got better. Every year we got better and better at this in terms of like, where do we need to be this month, next month? How do we need to be tracking? But I also knew like, where were we six months in needed to be basically the run rate. Assuming we went from zero to, you know, like the run rate for a million bucks is what, 80, is that? 8250, I think. Yeah. Yeah. A month. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Don't make me do math on a podcast. <laughs> there we go. 82,500 a month. So anyways, we... Uh, I knew around 80 grand. And so I was like, okay, so we need to be there within six months because then we need to make up for not being there the first six months. So we need to balance it out and assume that if we're going growing steadily, that'll be where we need to do it. Now we're in marketing. Q4 is usually a little better. So we end up growing up. So, but yeah, I mean, first year we did 
1.01 million dollars like literally just beat it um and it was uh it was surprising but we did it and it was all around uh yeah just aiming for it so like when we and again if i don't remember it's been seven and a half years but I, you know assuming there were ten, you know months where we were falling behind a little bit that's where we'd ramp it up and be like we got to bring in more business we got to retain what are we going to do to make sure we hit these numbers and we so we would it would you know light a fire under ass to hit it because also those were ambitious goals to grow that fast and yeah. to grow 150 percent the next year and 100 percent the next year and 100 percent the next year we had to do a lot and so anytime we were off track it just kicked us into gear that we have to hit that so and i and i like that you know too many people set out a goal but then they don't have an action plan in order to hit it or a, a place where they can measure it and they just look oh january came oh we didn't hit it well, yeah, no, right. no shit. Like you, you yeah. were reactive to the market. You weren't proactive. You didn't try new things. You just kind of sat back. And, yeah, the, the term I hear from the best operators out there is leading indicators. What are the actual controllable leading indicators that get to that result? And in the first year, we had no idea because, like, I don't know how many people I have to talk to, to how many leads we get to. Like, we didn't have a funnel built, but I did know when we weren't hitting it the levers to pull. So I didn't have it down to a science yet. Now we do. Now my forecaster can give us our revenue within 1% and is forecasted the entire year accurately based on what the inputs are. And then it's just a function of man, you know, being disciplined about the inputs is how you scale a business at this size and even earlier, but statistics play out the bigger you get too. Yeah. What, what are some of the, now that you guys have figured it out um, or up till this point, what are some of the leading indicators that are really important for getting over the eight figure mark? Yeah, so I would say having a really good handle on your average retention of a client is number one. Um, what, how much is the average lifetime of a client? What's the average retention? It also depends on your agency. We run an agency with that's a different type of scale. We have six hundred active clients. So if you're running more of a traditional, like you know, creative agency, or you know, you have bigger clients but smaller amount, the statistics get a little harder. But for us, because of the scale averages play out. And so we know our average lifetime value of a customer. We consistently try to improve that, but we know where it is and we measure against it constantly so that we can improve it and know that we're doing things that improve it. And then what's your cost to acquire a customer and what your pipeline looks like and what are your conversions on the pipeline? So from lead to qualified lead to, for us, proposal to service agreement, to verbal commitment, to a signed commitment, what is the break breakage in each of those stages? And then we know based on the pipeline we have, how much business is going to come in, in the next month or two? And then we can, you know, also then know what does it cost us to get a lead? How much are we investing in marketing? Which ways are we going to drive those leads? So how many leads about can we assume? And then you get that waterfall and you can start to anticipate how many leads do you need? And then you manage against that. Okay, so we're going to need whatever it is, a thousand leads this month to hit the numbers we want to hit next month. Let's go make sure we get a thousand leads. What are the ways to do that? Well, we have outbound marketing. We have outbound sales. We have partnerships. We have every type of inbound marketing, advertising, et cetera. These are all things we can, levers we can pull to make sure we hit the lead count we need to. And then frankly, at this stage, all leads are not created equal. So we actually measure different leads at different values. I love it. Yeah, I, lo I love that you look at the leading indicators because then you can make the adjustment rather than wait yep. wait to the very end. Um, let's let's kind of switch focus or maybe not switch focus too much, yep. but let's talk about the, the Hawk method. Tell us a little bit more sure. about that. Yeah, so it's been, you know, basically our marketing methodology that I've leveraged, right? You know, it's been how I look at marketing for a dozen years, but Hawk Media has the entire time. I've spoken about this you know, hundreds of times at different conferences, and we decided to put a book together called The Hawk Method that we just pre-launched. Um, it's coming out in Q1 uh, that basically kind of digests in a really easy to digest way everything we think of when we're looking at a company and their marketing. So how do we look at their strategy? How do we assess what they're doing? And how do we know where to invest, where to pull back, what channels to use? And so it goes from like the very high level, we call it awareness, nurturing and trust, the three pillars of marketing. And so we look at, you know, are they covering those three pillars? Where are they not covering? And then we dive into like on awareness, breaks down into advertising and PR and word of mouth and a few other things. And then even in advertising, where do you advertise? Is it Google? Is it Facebook? Is it TikTok, Snapchat, et cetera? And so we break down into how to look at all these different things from a way in a way that we try to make it replicable as things change, meaning like it's a, it's a thesis and a methodology. It's not 
a tactic that works right now and won't work a year from now. And so, yeah, we basically put that together in a 200 page book and are putting it out there uh, and working on selling 20,000 copies and making it a New York Times bestseller. And we've already had several universities pick it up. Um, like we're, we're really making traction on getting it out there as a new way of looking at marketing. What are, I mean, obviously you've seen a ton of agencies and you guys have acquired a, a bunch from what I've, what I've heard. What do you think on a marketing front agencies do wrong for themselves? Uh, interesting. I think. So this is my a very controversial statement, but I think that they protect themselves too much when they get good. I think that the, what I see happen with agencies that I don't agree with that has worked for plenty of people. So I'm not saying that never do this. I'm just saying this is my own view of it. Every agency that gets good and gets a good reputation, starts to be seen well in the, you know, sort of in the ecosystem, they start protecting themselves. They start throwing out long contracts, high minimums. They go up market. They only want to work with Fortune 2000. They do all these things that, uh, yes, they created, it's a solid way of doing business. I get it, but it alienates all the people that got you there. So I'm always it kind of turned sideways to that. Is why can't you build a business model? And now thankfully we have, but this was our thesis, but why can't you build a business model off still being one of the best marketing companies out there, but still working with small and medium businesses too. Not saying don't work with Nike and the big guys, but you can work with small guys too. And so that's really what built it. I think that a lot of times, is interesting. I watch a lot of agencies struggle to get up to the eight figure mark because they get a little pretentious and they, and too early. There's agencies that are doing eight figures that I know that get pretentious and do just fine with it because they can be. Um, I'd say W promote, you know, in the market, you know, they're constantly trying to go up market and stop working with small and medium businesses. They, you know, got, I think it was Gartner to rate them as one of the best digital agencies like a few years ago. And like, so they started getting a bunch of Fortune 500 interest and, you know, leverage that. I don't know how it's gone for them in the past couple of years because actually those agencies hurt really bad in COVID. Um, but I think, the, you know, there's reasons to do it later, but a lot of companies jump the gun and then they're like, oh, you know, my, one of my favorite things is like, we're, we're staying small in boutique because we can serve our clients better. And my, I always go, okay, so you're telling me that I should hire you to scale my business and you don't know how to scale your own. Like explain that one to me. Now, if it's a creative agency, different story, but I'm talking about like the growth and performance agencies that say they're staying boutique. I'm like, then you're not good because you don't know what growth, you don't understand growing a business. Well, I think what happens is they hit, like I look at it as like six stages of scaling an agency and yeah. they get to a point where their business doesn't have the right systems in place. You know, everything relies on them. They haven't shared the vision with their their uh, their leadership team. They don't have a leadership team, right? Yeah. They've gotten to this point by accident. And I think you can get over the couple million by accident. Getting to the eight I, figure mark is not by accident, but yeah. to stay there is true skill. Um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, you brought up this note earlier that I actually think relates to that. So I drove 85% uh, of our business up until we were about a 7 million run rate. And so, and then is the most ridiculous story, so I'm gonna skim over it, but I was hanging out in Monaco during the Grand Prix and seeing the most, the richest people in the world living their lives and went, yeah, I'm never gonna be that in the way I'm operating right now. And not that that's actually my goal, it's not really a monetary goal, but it's more like, I want the option. And so I immediately ejected out of sales, completely. It was scary as shit. Like I had a few sales guys, I was like, from now on all my leads go to you. I had this, the, I was keeping my better leads because I could close them better. But I'm like, but if I give them the sales, like they're still going to close a lot of them, right? Hopefully took that leap of faith. Thankfully had a good small group of guys that uh, ended up doing really well with those leads. And, but we did dip. We went, that was June, July and August were down months for us and a little scary. And then we recovered and started scaling again. So I, uh, yeah, that, that was, that was what got us into eight figure range because that was the last piece. I never on the execution side, I immediately brought on a partner. That's my co-founder that did a great job of, as he put it, I'd make promises and he'd deliver on them. And uh, <laughs> you deliver and broken promises without him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and you got to know your strengths, but uh, he, he definitely did a great job on that side. And so we were able to scale that side from the beginning pretty well. So delivery wasn't as much of an issue because I also, because I was the one driving sales, I did a lot of things that helped us sell. 
So I productized our offerings. I made things really easy to sell and really easy to put together and then built a team around that. So when I built a sales team, it was teed up for them in a way that was great too, which now we have one of the more uh, higher producing sales teams in the industry period. We're you know, bringing on 80 new clients a month. So um, that, that was built because of that, but it took that leap to be like, all right, I'm done. I can't do this. And I continue to do that. And that was a good, that was three and a half years in. And that became a good lesson that over and over again, when I find myself, in, you know, diving into something that's taking all, a lot of my time, if I can out eject, I eject, whatever that is, and continue to hone in more like my focus more day to day is like a third strategic and working with our executives on like bigger initiatives to grow the business, a third growth, what expansion can we do, whether it's M&A, whether it's launching a fund, what else can we do to build off this business? And a third promotional, being on podcasts, you know, writing the book, that kind of thing. And that's literally, that becomes more and more my focus. And when I find things now pulling me out of that, I look for who else could have that job. Yeah, I, uh, I always tell everybody, your goal is to transform from the owner to the CEO. And like you said, it's kind of like four or five roles. Set the vision of the went, agency. I went for a program two weeks ago that actually said the exact opposite. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, because they said your goal is to transform from a CEO to an owner, meaning your business should be working for you, not you running the business. And I think the problem is what do people, you know, there's the CEO of your own one person company, but when you're an owner and you're just, you you know, you treat yourself as a chairman or an investor, the way you operate is different. And we're getting there. Like that's been, that was the goal for this year was to get our executive team in a place where I didn't have to do a lot of what they do. And we're there. We have a great executive team. We brought in a COO two months ago. And so he's now stepping up and the goal is for him to, run the day-to-day -day of Hawk Media. So my focus can be on doing a better job for our clients, expanding the business. You know, so again, strategic and growth, not you know managing the day-to-day, -day, like where's our accounts receivable? Yeah, and I, I remember I was chatting with one of my clients for many, many years. He started out around 300,000, now he's well over the eight figure mark. And I remember telling him, when you transform from the owner to the CEO, congratulations, you're gonna be depressed. Yeah. Because the business, like you'll go into a meet, and I remember going through this. Like I would go into a meeting, and they go, "Jason, I don't need you." And then I go to the next one, "Jason, I don't need you." And I'm like, "Shit, the business doesn't need me. Like, what the hell do I need to do?" And then someone smart that ran another agency was like, "No, look, set the vision, communicate it often, be the face of the organization, yeah. coach your leadership team, you know, assist sales when you need be, like add color, right? That's that's all yeah. I'm good at." Um, yeah. if you want me to do follow up and that shit, like, no, like, <laughs> you're probably right. really good at, it at one point. Oh yeah. Well, when you had to be right. Yeah. Like, but yep. then, then when you start, you know, getting like tasting that really fancy champagne, I don't drink champagne, but I guess when <laughs> some people drink fancy champagne or what is it, Don Perignon or I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I drink the Coca-Cola's I guess. Right. But when you yeah, drink the, that, that's it. I drink, I drink about a thousand of those a day. <laughs> well, I, there's gotta be something unhealthy about them, but I don't know. That. Someone there's told me it rots your teeth. Eventually. I'm like, I don't care. The Coke Coke I use to clean my race car engine. Um, so I might go. as well stop drinking that. <laughs> yeah. That's probably a good move. <laughs> right, awesome. Well, uh, Eric, this has been great. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit the audience? Yeah, I would say the one big thing that every, or not every, but most marketers miss that is just a huge one for agencies too, is the idea of a sales cycle or per, purchase cycle or uh, consideration period, where when you advertise for a client, they're looking for daily reports on the performance. Yet what we've seen in e-commerce specifically is, fi uh, what we've seen in specifically in e-commerce is for a $50 average order value, it's about a three week purchase cycle. For $100, it's about five weeks. For $200, it's about six weeks. And then it goes between two and three months from there. The, how do I put it? The issue there is like, if so if I raise your budgets today, you're not gonna see the performance on it for months, potentially. And so understanding that purchase cycle so that you report against it is critical in the agency client relationship, as well as just clients understanding their marketing. And we see this, we get into this fight a lot where it's like a row as this. It's like, that's a seven day fucking window. You have a $400 product. What are you talking about? So yeah. Yeah. That's well, it's the big about one. Two, knowing the right clients to bring on. Cause yeah. you know, I always say there's no such thing as a bad agency client. There's only a bad prospect or a bad process. And you yeah. got to kind of figure it out and be like, Hey, if this is a bad prospect, let's not let them in. Like, 
Yeah, you know, agreed. If he wants, and like, I'm like, dude, I don't, if you're at zero ROAS, eventually, like, you're going to be so far in the, the green, like, who cares? <laughs> you're getting free advertising. <laughs> 100%. So, one last question I had. I, I lied, I guess. I Sorry. remember some, maybe sometime back, and maybe you've changed this. Do you guys still not have any contracts or uh, long term yeah. contracts? We're still month to month. Okay. Why is that? And how, obviously, it's working well for you. I, I've seen some people struggle with it, I've seen some people yeah. love it. So, it's not easy. It's, uh, I just, I was on the other side and, Everyone was asking me to get married before they ever went on a date with me. And it just felt screwed up. Like, I'm not here to protect my vendors is kind of how I felt about it. And I, I'm sorry to use a derogatory term in our space, but if I'm running a brand and I'm hiring you to do my marketing, I don't give a shit if you want a long-term contract. I'm not signing it. And we still stand true to that. Like, when people try to give us longer contracts, we just say no. And if you don't want our business, that's fine. We walked away from a few uh, software companies. who are like, we have never used your software. So like you want to give us a three month trial, we'll do it. Because as they said, it's not enough time to ramp up in a month. I'm like, you want to give us a three month trial, we'll do it. But I'm not signing a three year contract. You're out of your fucking mind. Like that's just doesn't make sense to me. And so we just stuck to that. And then right now, our like our mission statement's accessibility to great marketing. The idea is we want to be nimble, flexible, accessible, and built that way and be the best at what we do. So by being month to month, it forces us to be able to be flexible and nimble. We're just used to it. Our business has to function that way. Yeah. And then going back to, you know, your leading indicators and knowing your lifetime value of a client, like you can calculate, like when I look at, you know, our mastermind, an average member is in there 24 months. Yep. And like, when you know that that's predictability, because I always tell people, you know, when we go to buy an agency, a lot of times, you know, when you acquire agency, you want to know predictability, um, yep. the longer term contracts, a lot of times you'll get a higher valuation because of the predict predictability is right. there. But if you can show a track record of, yep. hey, your clients stayed this long, that will act exactly. the same More way. Scale averages. And I will say, because we've dealt with all those conversations, like if you're looking for an investor to value you or a buyer, get a smart one that understands your business. Don't go with someone that's using a cookie cutter approach to buying a <laughs> business because you're not going to get a good evaluation. And my wife's a uh, senior exec in private equity. We have a venture fund. I look at those numbers all the time and it's like, I've had all those stupid conversations. I, I, you know, where it's like either you're stupid or you think I'm stupid because this, what you're saying is not actually how it works in this world. And that's another good piece of advice I got a long time ago is have your pulse on, if your plan is to sell, which thankfully is not ours, but I get it for a lot of people, have your pulse on the industry, know what it is to do M and A in your industry. Like talk to a banker once a quarter, talk to people, keep your information. So you know what the multiples are, you know, what's happening, you know, who the buyers are, have a relationship with them. And if again, your goal is to sell, Call the people that would buy you and ask them what they would want to buy and just build that. It's yeah, really and easy. I'm happy to I, tell you. I, and I love that. I'm like, yeah, if you know, like make a target list now of the people you yep. would love to buy you and start forming yep. a relationship with them now. Yep. Makes it so much easier to get a deal done. And then you know you can trust them. They can trust you. Like that part is so important. And yeah, I mean, there's no reason for them not to tell you exactly what they want to buy. You just make it easy for them. Unless They're they don't know what they want to buy. <laughs> But again, there's, then a you ton, don't sell to them. there's a ton of yeah. people out there like that. Then don't sell to them because you don't want, you know, that type of buyer. You want someone that's very confident and knows what they're doing so that you can, depending on what your outcome is too. The only thing I'd say, the caveat is if you're really looking to just straight exit and get out, then it doesn't matter as much who the buyer is, yeah. but you'll probably, that's a hard thing to do with an agency. And you're probably going to deal with a lot of headaches with an uneducated buyer. Well, yeah. And, and you're not going to get the valuation or the money that you want if you want straight out. Yeah. Like, you yeah, know, buyers like us will be like, all right, what's wrong? Like, what are you not yeah, telling us? Exactly. Yeah. Or, well, you know, all I we've looked at those deals. We actually, funny enough, we just passed on one, but we look at those deals, but we offer less. We're like, hey, like, if you're not there, you're, there's a loss in value. Yeah, you know, so. exactly. And that yep. should make you feel good. <laughs> the fact, especially if you're a sub eight figure agency, like you can't tell me that you're not driving the boat. Yeah, exactly. Where, uh, where, what's the title of the book and where can people get it? Hawk Method. You can get it at hawkmethod.com, H-A-W-K-E method.com. Awesome. Well, everyone go check that out. Eric, thanks so much for coming on the show. And if you guys want to be around amazing agency owners that have 
been to where you want to go and be able to see the things that you might not be able to see and just have a lot of fun and share the strategies. I want you all to go to digitalagencyelite.com. This is our exclusive mastermind for experienced seven and eight figure agencies and beyond. So make sure you go there now, go to digitalagencyelite.com. And until next time, have a swank day.